Matt, you all know me as Bud, but that's not my real name. My official name is Victor. Uh, and I use Victor for like formal things and when I'm, uh, you know, doing something where I don't want them to know I'm Bud. But you're my friends and uh, therefore I'm Bud to all of us. However, my email reflects the Victor. So you see that my email is viclandry at outlook.com, not budlandry. I don't even know if there is a budlandry.com, but you know, um, there might be. Anyway, anyway. So <clears throat> this course is called The Last Days According to Jesus Hyphen Selected Topics. I mean, there's a lot. There is, an, I told the Pastor Diane that I cut it down to, to eight weeks. And, um, you know, because there's so much out there, so much, there's so many directions we can go with this. But I call it selected topics because, frankly, there are parts of eschatology that I don't know and I have not been able to figure out. So I skip those parts. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do the parts I, I believe that are solid. But anyway, so we're at uh, just about 11 o'clock, so let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, Please be with us this morning as we delve into your deep water of the future. What is all about? We're going to consider worldviews today, and we would ask you to guide our thinking, our understanding, and especially my words. Amen. Now, here's the thing. I am sure I'm going to offend you. Okay, and, you know, I'm going to start with that premise. Somewhere in the next eight weeks, I'm going to say something that, you know, you're going to have a hard time with. And that's very possible, and, and that's really okay. So, my unique experience, you need to know something about me. All my life, I've been a teacher. Uh, really, I started right after I get, got out of college, I uh, started teaching high school. And I taught biology for 10 years, and I got a degree in biology. Then I got a, a master's in biology. And then later on, I got another master's. Uh, from there, I went on to the community college. I taught there for a while. And at the, at the, and at the university, I uh, did a course at the University of Pittsburgh. And then I did several at uh, Duquesne University. So I've always been teaching. And the more you teach, the more you learn. Because it's a truism that the teacher himself, herself, is the one who learns. Because you have to dig into it to really know it so you can present it. So it turns out we know a lot about different things. We're going to follow this book. Uh, you don't need to, this is it right here, you don't need to buy it, uh, but this is what I'm following. And it's available at Amazon, and I think the price of it is uh, 11.87 or something like that. Yeah, so uh, excuse me, 11.89 at Amazon. But you don't need it. But if you would like it, then by all means, get it. Um, this is a book by R.C. Sproul. Now, I don't know if you know who he is, but in my estimation, he is the finest Reformed theologian that there is. Anything that he pretty much puts out is pretty darn good stuff. Um, and I admire his work immensely. So we're following, to some degree, uh, what is in that book, okay? But there's, in the back, if you haven't had a chance to pick up the syllabus and the bibliography, and again, you don't need that right now, but you know, don't leave home without it, because it's good to have. All right, so let's get into it. Miss Piggy <laughs> starts us off. I don't know if you've been reading the e-blasts, the devotionals, but there have been a number that I wrote in the last several months, and I realized that all of them have to do with this. And the title of this one here, uh, which came out months ago, was that um, Miss Piggy dead at 49. And she actually is 40. It's been 49 years since Miss Piggy came out. Anyway. The reason why I wrote this one is the question came up somewhere, what happens at death and what happens to our body? And my sister, for example, uh, had a very interesting conversation with her and she wanted to know what our plans were 
for uh, after death? Do we plan to uh, be in the ground? Do we plan to be on a mantelpiece? Do we plan to be, you know, cremated in some way? What was our plans? And I said to her, Marion, it doesn't matter really what happens because ultimately it's dust to dust and ashes to ashes. So I like to think of it I like to think of it like this. This is me, a pretty old glove. I've been around and I've done a lot of dirty stuff. And if you think about it, you know, I started out life as a nice, pristine, clean glove. But over time, it got dirty, it got used. But the glove moves, you see, and it's fairly animated. But it moves only because there's a hand in it. Now, take the hand out of the glove, the glove is nothing, right? Instead, what's going to happen someday, the hand, that is to say my spirit, goes into a better glove, prettier, a little bit spotted with green. I don't know. Not the manly work glove, but still it's a, another glove. You follow what I'm saying? So what's this all about? These are the bodies. This is the spirit. And there's... This is the emblem for Duquesne University. It says, Spiritus S. Key Vivificat. And that means it is a spirit that gives or makes alive. Okay? So we are alive because our spirit is here, right? Okay. So I wrote that one. And, uh, you know, and I had to say at the end of it that Miss Piggy still hasn't died, okay, in case anybody got really upset. <laughs> the next one I wrote is this one. Um, this is the raven, and the raven comes from uh, Edgar Allan Poe, okay, and um, Edgar Allan had a very unfortunate relationship with women in his life. They died on him. They all died. His sisters, his mother, his girlfriends, they all died. And the man is bereft with uh, mourning. And then in this particular poem, he's tormented by a raven who flies into his window. And there's over here. So, uh, flies into his window. And the only thing the raven says is nevermore. He says, tell me, where is my sweet, the girl's name is Lenore, where is Lenore? Will I ever see Lenore again? And the raven keeps saying, nevermore, nevermore, nevermore. But you see, that's not the way it is for us. That's not for us what happens. Nevermore becomes forevermore. Okay, so, but again, you know, the, the thinking here for me was kind of focused on death and dying. This one here. Uh, and again, this is from an um, e-blast. This is a painting called First Morning by Alfonso uh, Bogaro uh, from 1890s. Now, this is a play on words when we say first morning, because what this is, that is Abel dead on Adam's lap. Eve is inconsolate. What's happening here? A death is, has occurred. A murder has occurred. And we have the two kids, one kills the other. What's going to take place? So what's important about this one is not so much that there was this death, but what happens next. So Cain is marked by God so that anybody who finds him will not kill him. Okay? Now what is that all about? And the thing that that's about is God's grace. Even though Cain is a murderer and a bum and all the rest, he still is marked with God's protection. Because Peter says that God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So we don't know ultimately if Cain ever made. My suspicion is he didn't, but I don't know that. Uh, I'm holding out hope for his uh, redemption. I'm holding out hope that he repented, but I don't know. All right. So that's first morning. This one here, this is, comes our time. This is Ukraine. Okay. I think you kind of get the idea of what's going on. This uh, woman probably just newly widowed and there's the destruction behind her. And I think about the sin that Jesus took upon himself. Look, think about that. 
he took upon himself the sin of the world. And when is it enough? You know, when can you imagine the extent of the sin that he bore? Throughout the ages, throughout time, he's bearing the sin of the world. And how does that work? And, you know, in that particular um, devotional, I said kind of rhetorically, why is it still going on? Why is there still evil? You ever thought about that? Why is there still evil? I thought we took care of that back here on the cross. Why is it still happening? And uh, in the, uh, one of my references, the theology of Paul the Apostle, he explains it like this. And when you, this concept actually works for a lot of things. And the concept is already done, not yet done. Okay, think about that. The work of total defeat of evil was totally done at the cross, but yet it's still not finalized yet. It's, it's already done, but not yet done. And the analogy that they use is an, an analogy from World War II. When the Normandy invasion occurred, for all practical purposes, the war was over. It was done, but not yet, because there's still battles to be fought. So the, there's going to be a time when it will all be done, but presently, it's not yet. Okay. Oh, by the way, you know, at any point, you know, you want to jump in and ask something, I'd be happy to talk with you or entertain that. This, this one here, this is, well, let's consider the picture. The man is dead. He's wearing a cross. So we're going to say he's a believer. That's an angel as identified by the wings. Angels, by the way, don't have wings. But in order so you would know, you know, that's an angel. And look at what she's doing. Or I guess it's a she. That's not really fair. He <laughs> the angel is gathering a fire from the center of the man's chest. That's his life fire. And what's, he gonna, she, what's the angel going to do with that? Angel will take it to the Father. This guardian angel has been with him all his life. When we were growing up, did anybody learn about guardian angels? In your tradition, you know, we come from different traditions, but in your tradition, you ever hear about a guardian angel? Yeah. And that's very scriptural because Jesus says, talking about the little kids, says their angels are standing in the presence of the Father. Okay? And the, the more you read the scripture, the more you run into angels. Okay? Anyway, when, I, when you're in parochial school and they tell you about guardian angels, the first thing you do is you scoot over and make room for them. <laughs> you ever do that? Yeah, that's pretty common. After a while, you know, you kind of forget about them, so you'll go, go sit wherever you want. But, you know, that's what you do with a guardian angel. So I, that's a good concept, and it is scriptural. As a matter of fact, I ran it past uh, Pastor Craig. You know, make sure we're not teaching something that is not right. When we ran it past him, he was okay with that. Okay, this one here is when we meet again in heaven, and this will be the last one of this. But this is the joy of the future. Now, you might lose, look carefully. You'll see it's a cemetery. And here, this is the general resurrection. And look what's happening. People are just so glad to see one another again, right? A tremendous concept. And the thing is, resurrection is bodily. It's bodily. Jesus had a body. He ate. He, you know, was touchable. He was amongst them. And therefore, because Jesus is our covenant brother, what happens to him happens to us. He rose bodily. We rose, will rise bodily. Now, people ask me sometimes, will we recognize one another in heaven? And I say, yes and no. Here's the reason why. I would recognize my grandparents 
at the time that they died, but they were pretty old. I would not recognize them in their 20s, right? They would have to say, hey, it's me. Did you see the last Raiders, the, the last Indiana Jones movie? And well, it was a terrible movie, but anyway, it was, it really was. But here's what they did to Harrison Ford. They de-aged him. That was pretty neat, you know, so they could make him look as he did earlier, okay? So will we recognize each other? I don't know. We might have to wear our name tags a little bit more, but because we're going to look so much better. Okay, we're not going to go through heaven with the warts and with the need for glasses and, you know, all the rest of the stuff. We're going to be a whole lot better. And therefore, we might to some degree not be recognizable at first. Okay, but, you know, we will um, recognize each other enough. And I think that's a wonderful concept. And one of the things I like to tell people, heaven is a place of hellos and no goodbyes. You know, we meet one another on earth, you know, and we're with each other for a while. And before you know it, we leave, we go someplace or we depart this world. In heaven, there's no departing. We are together. Okay, now, if, per chance, per chance, you would like to read these devotionals in their entirety, uh, send me an email. You probably have read them already. I'm probably just telling you about stuff you've already seen. But if you'd like to see the actual, I can send you a link for that. Okay. Any questions about this? Anything you'd like to talk about? Because I know I can speed up and go pretty fast. I don't want to do it. What if you're cremated? Oh, same thing. You know, um, here's, okay. Think, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you see, it's not a matter of taking the dead bones and putting them flesh on. You go to a cemetery that's been a couple hundred years old. What's there? Nothing, nothing. Because it has decayed to the point where there's nothing left, right? You know, like I remember a time when um, my parents, when they were much younger, were visited by a funeral director. And the, the guy had the brochures and all that. And he brings, I said, okay, here's a vault. And it's sealed, you know, it's got a rubber gasket around it. No water is going to get in. You're going to be fine. Well, you're not really, you're dead. But you're going to be, <laughs> you know, but your body is going to be fine, okay? Well, you go to it now, it's crumbled in. The vault has decayed. It was only concrete. Ultimately, 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 it's dust. You know, so no matter how we go, we go and it's dust, Okay. So cremation is really simply the act of speeding up that dissolution process, okay? Now, here's the other thing. God made you, and he still has the blueprint, all right? He knows how to make you again. He did it the first time. So I know there's some denominations have a hard time with cremation. I don't know if they still do. I think most denominations are now okay with that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. So obviously, VPC, you know, with a columbarium, you know. Yeah. Yes? Since we're talking about, you know, what happens to us after we die, mm -hmm. do you believe, or uh, per the scriptures, that, you know, we we die until the resurrection, but we don't have a concept of what's going on. I mean, okay, so you're, you're asking between death and resurrection. Right. Yeah, are we, is that a resurrection? Well, this is obviously, this is fanciful, you know, obviously. This is, a, you know, they're just trying to illustrate that concept because in actual fact, these folks would not look like that. But um, so between death and resurrection, it's a tough question. Okay, that's a tough question. We are obviously in existence, but yet not with, as far as I know, still not with a body. That still waits, that general resurrection. But we are still, we exist, absolutely. I think, are you asking, will we be aware that we have passed and are in the Lord's right, presence? Right, and maybe in the in presence, because then yeah. uh, I'm trying to grasp for the scriptures that talks about So, um, I don't know. 
I think we know that we are with the Lord immediately. Because yes. Jesus said to the good thief, this day, but you will be with me. Right, when Jesus is and on the cross, I mean, he has two criminals yeah. beside him. He's saying, hey, in just a few minutes, basically, you're going to be with me in paradise. So, right. So, I mean, it's mysterious, I but I think the Lord can do anything. You know, I mean, I think there is an awareness of you as a spiritual being now in God's presence, and then when the resurrection comes, the uniting of the body with the spirit will take place, and that's when we'll have, you know, because they're talking about a physical earth, like a physical place. It's not going to be ethereal, like airy. It's a physical place that we'll inhabit. So, like a new heaven, a new earth. So, what does that mean? Ideally, I, or actually, I don't know. We're just... It would be nice if somebody came back and told us, but Jesus did. See, so he didn't tell us. <laughs> That's true. You know, Jesus is the only person who has come back from the dead, and he gives us some indication of what it's like to have died and been resurrected. The resurrection is of vital importance. As a matter of fact, there is no Christianity without resurrection. Think about that. Okay? There is no Christianity without resurrection. The specifics, though, of that time period between now and then, that is the thing which I'm a little unsure of. Okay, that's why it's, it's selected topics, because I don't know them all. All right. So eschatology, what is that? That's a fancy word for what happens at the end. For, in other words, final things, final things. And there's two aspects to it. Personal, what's going to happen to us, and global, what happens to everything. And frankly, we need to think about the personal first because our going, most likely, will happen before His coming. Okay? I mean, there will be people around at the very end, but for the most part, for the most part, our going happens before His coming. So eschatology. Christianity, you probably have noticed, has been criticized a lot. Okay? It's criticized because of the it's leveled at the trustworthiness of Scripture, and it's linked to questions regarding biblical eschatology. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the points of attack that Christianity has been under. Okay? Number one point of attack, the inspiration of Scripture relating to eschatology. Two-thirds of the New Testament. And that's, you say, well, how could it be two-thirds? Well, remember, the whole book of Revelation is future. See? So you put that in. Now, did I do a page count? No. But I'm taking this. Two-thirds of the New Testament deals with future prophecy. So then if that prophecy is suspect, then there are serious questions about the nature and the credibility of the Bible. And then, if that's the case, more serious is the credibility of Jesus. And they say, and I'll show you some of the people who said it coming up, they said, well, Jesus' prophecies did not come to pass within the time frame he said that they would. Okay? But, let's look at that. This guy here, he kind of looks like a a pistol, doesn't he? <laughs> Bertram Russell attacked the validity of Scripture and Jesus himself because he's saying, this, you know, remember Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away? What does he mean by generation? Okay, That's it. Is he talking about the people who are alive at that time? Or does generation mean something altogether different? We'll look at this more in week three. So what he was doing, he was claiming that Jesus is a false prophet. That's not nice. <laughs> well, especially knowing that Jesus is sinless. And yet, to, to be accused of being a false prophet, that's bad. This, however, is a major stumbling block with the Jews. If you were to Google why Jews don't believe in Jesus, they're going to say Jesus was a false prophet because the things he said about his second coming did not occur 
as he said it. I'm talking about the Olivet Discourse. Okay, Olivet Discourse. And if you were a false prophet in uh, Israel, you get stoned to death. Okay? Because a false prophet made claims that did not come to pass. So if you take that, then what happens to our understanding of Jesus? So if he's not accurate with his prediction, then he's reduced to a moralistic teacher, a moralistic Jew who advocates a kingdom of values and social responsibility. And they talk about the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man as a new religion. But that's not it. Jesus didn't come to give us that, the universal fatherhood of God, universal brotherhood of man. No, Jesus was, came so we would be one with the Father and Him and His kingdom would be restored. Hmm? All right. I got to share this with you. All right. I don't know if anybody is from the New York City metropolitan area in the 1950s, early 1950s. I was, okay? So the show ran 1950 to 1956. And um, this show featured, of course, a mailman. And on this show, he said, boys and girls, write to me any questions you have. Okay, write to me any questions you have. Now, again, I went to parochial school and by six, age six, I could write and mail, send letters, okay? <laughs> I mean, ask a six, six-year-old today to do that, okay? But back then, six, back then second graders, and now six in the second grade, second graders can write and send mail. Now, granted, it wasn't uh, Shakespeare that they were writing, but, <laughs> and it probably wasn't even ink because they didn't let us use ink until the fourth grade because you can imagine what a mess a kid would make. But they well, you know, okay. So I said, okay, I have a question, Mary Mellon. And I wrote him a letter. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, How come you never told me this? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I always want to keep a secret to you. <laughs> But I had a question, okay, I had a question. And so you send it in, and a couple weeks later, you know, he's on the air, and everything's black and white, of course, and he opens it up. I said, ah, oh, we have a letter from Buddy Landry. Let's see what Buddy wants to know. And I said, what is beyond outer space? <laughs> well, that's a good question. What is beyond outer space? You know, you hit the edge of the universe. Does the universe end? It doesn't end. Is there a place where it ends? Does it go on forever? And if it does go on forever, how can it? Okay. So, think about that. What do you suppose is beyond outer space? Now, to help you with that, I don't know if I have enough sound. This is from not the Webb telescope. This is the Hubble. So it's, but look at the immensity of space. Now, oops, let me go back. Okay, so in that last scene, it almost looked like a hand. It wasn't a hand. It looked like a hand, but it wasn't. Okay, that last video, let me go back. Okay, so this is a mere 6,500 light years away, which is not far at all 
in terms of, but consider the galaxy. This is the Milky Way. Consider how many stars and consider the number of planets around the star, the moons, the, the entire creation. And Diane in today's uh, e-blast shared something kind of similar. It almost looks like it, but it's not. Okay, I don't want to mislead you. Though that is not a hand. Okay. Anything you want to ask about that? That's like I said. That's the Hubble, and we now have a more powerful telescope in deeper space. Uh, that is the Webb, and I'll show you that some other time. But here's my point: If we want to see the holiness of God. How do we do that? How do we, how do we even comprehend that concept of holiness? What does that mean? We can see God's work, and that's a reflection of His greatness. But how does it work? There's two concepts here by the bullet, transcendent and eminent. Emmanuel. So the question is, where is God? People like to know that. Where is he? Is he 100 billion light years away at the very edge of the universe, somehow looking down on us? Or is he present in his creation? Or is it both? It's both. Huh? So, you know, we talk about the favorite names for God. Emmanuel, God is with us, and yet God is also exalted, dwells in heaven, enthroned on high. He himself is the most high. Okay, so a lot of people would say, I'm very happy to have God 18 billion light years away, and don't bother me. It's a whole other story to think of God here with us, huh? These are not stars, by the way. They're galaxies. They're galaxies. And that is from the uh, Webb telescope. That's just a photograph of it. A galaxy is what? You know, how immense, how many stars in a galaxy, how many planets and all the rest. How immense is the universe? And if the universe is immense, then how much greater is God? Here's the thing. If you make something, let's say you are a woodworker, and you say, okay, I made this great chest of drawers. Okay? And people say, that is a great chest of drawers. Yet you are much greater than what you did. The creator of something is infinitely greater than what he made. Capiche? Okay? So this shows us, and I'll, I'll have it next week, it shows us the greatness of God as reflected by his creation. All right, so now back to the Merry Mailman. So I said to the Merry Mailman, what is outside of outer space? And he says, infinity. And that's a tough one. Actually, I had a hard time with that for a long, long time. Infinity, what is that? So I said, hold on, Mr. Mailman. I didn't say that then. Uh, but I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about it all my life. I've been thinking about this dialogue. And I say, wait a minute. Space is a created thing. All created things have limits. Therefore, space cannot be infinite. Okay, let's follow that again. Only God is uncreated. If space was not created, then it would be God. There are no created things without limits because they're created. Oh, left out an E. Therefore, space must end somewhere, somehow, but it cannot be infinite. How does this happen? I don't know. 
Okay. So, his glory, his holiness, mirrored in his creation. Let's talk about prophecy. Now, again, is it literally true that two-thirds is prophetic in the New Testament? Well, let's just take it, let's just say it is. Okay, let's just say in some way it is. This business of prophecy, though, is a big part of what goes on in the Bible. Now, in the Old Testament, sure, they're prophesying about the coming Messiah, but did prof when did prophecy stop? When was the last, you know, if, if I was to say, well, you know, I'm going to be a prophet. I'm going to tell you something you didn't know, okay? So, prophecy, they tell us, and I believe them, prophecy stopped when the New Testament, when the canon of Scripture was complete. See, because before that point in time, which is, say, mid-first century, before that time, you still didn't have the complete canon. So there were prophets around, but it stopped once the canon of Scripture was complete. Well, you might not be surprised that prophecy has been misused in the church. And what's going on here? It leads to disdain for Christ, for the Bible, and for the church. Now, ignorant people have defined us in the eyes of the world. Now, let's, let me stop here for a second. The misuse of prophecy. Deus Volt, in the year 1096, and I do happen to have a Latin scholar here with me. Deus Volt. God wills it. Exactly, exactly. God wills it. And you know who was saying that? The Pope. The Pope was sending out the first crusade, and he says, go, take Jerusalem, kill a whole bunch of people, because Deus Volt. Well, who says he vaulted it? Okay? That is a misuse. And, you know, so what's wrong about that is that this led to war. And not just war, but ongoing crusades. They weren't content with one. You know, they can, it continues. It continues. Deus Volt. And in modern times, I've been to various kinds of churches. And you could be in a church, fortunately not, VPC, where someone will say, you know what, brother or sister, God told me something about you. Oh, <laughs> what did he have to say? <laughs> and usually it's something like, you have, you're an alcoholic. <laughs> God told me you were. Cut it out. Quit it. And if we do stuff like that, that is taking God's name in vain. The second or third commandment, depending upon how you count, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What's that all about? That is false prophecy. Hmm? False prophecy. So God told me this about you. And, da, 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 da. and has anybody had that happen to them? Okay. Thus, comma, say it to the Lord, shout it out during a church service. Okay, how would that go at VPC? Okay, head ushers, get ready. Woman, man, stands up. Thus saith the Lord in front of everybody in the, during the service. Okay? Anybody go to a church like that? Okay, oh, you have, okay. All right. Now, that would be normative in that denomination. It's still crazy. But <laughs> that would be normative in that denomination. Is anybody familiar with glossolalia? Okay, Suzanne, what does it mean? Basically speaking in tongues. Right, speaking in tongues. So here's what would happen. Okay, not only do you have somebody standing up and giving their prophetic word, but it would be preceded 
by somebody speaking in tongues. Okay? And see, you don't know what they're saying because you don't speak ancient Egyptian. I'm assuming that's what it was. You never know. <laughs> but that person, you know, it would be like a pregnant pause, and then a second person would stand up and said, thus saith the Lord. In other words, they would interpret the tongues. Okay? You guys are missing a lot. <laughs> okay. Kind of similar to that. I see that you have a spirit of. Well, never a good spirit, you know. But someone's going to say to you, you have a spirit of gluttony. I don't know. That's wrong. Okay? We don't do that. I'm so glad of that. Okay. Tying today's events to the end times. It's a very tempting thing to do. All right? We look at the newspaper and we watch TV and you see what's going on. And you say, surely, Lord, this is it. This is it. You're going to smite us. And you, know, you say, smote them. <laughs> and you, know, you say, okay, this has got to be it. But they've been saying that for 2,000 years. During the Black Death of the 14th century, people are dropping, a third of the population died. You think things were bad with COVID? A third were dropping dead. And there was all kinds of other things going on. And people said, well, surely, surely this is the end of time. But it wasn't, was it? And you have other things going on. You had, you know, various wars. You had World War I, World War II. You say, oh, this is it, God, this just can't go on. And we have our present time. You cannot predict when it's the end time. And here's why. God is ever merciful. And it could very well be he wants to keep this thing running a couple more centuries to get more people saved. You see, if he pulled the plug on it now, well, those people would not be part of the, you know, gathering of the uh, sheep. So you make a mistake, even though it's very tempting to say, this is it. You know? Well, you know, and if you did a Google search on that, you'd find pages upon pages of false dates. They said, this is it. No, they kept, kept naming dates. If you name a date, you can be sure it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, moving on. Uh, Any questions about Yes. went out to us in the class, who did we think had been a prophet? Okay. There had to have been more prophets, actual prophets, sent by God to give voice. And who did we think they were? And we came up with different different names. The one most common was Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but that was a that's not a misuse of prophecy. Well, that's You're not saying there are no prophets. The prophet is speaking on behalf of God. It's not that he's not saying something socially important, mm -hmm. but he's contributing to the canon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Martin Luther King Jr. did not. You know what he was saying was reflection of what was already there. Right? Don't judge by the color of the skin. Well, that's clearly already stated. Um, so. In terms of what, uh, how I define a prophet as a biblical prophet is one who's speaking on behalf of God to the human race for a limited period of time with a final time sometime in the middle of the first century. Okay, uh, I'm trying to find resistance for this. Okay, talk about Mormons, for example. Anybody familiar with Mormons? Okay. Mormons are very large in the West, Southwest, okay? They have a Book of Mormon. Well, the Book of Mormon was written, what, 1869 or something like that. Um, golden plates dug up someplace in New York State. Okay, that is extra prophecy, extra books. What does it say at the end of Revelation? This is it. Do not add and do not subtract. 1,800 years later, they decided they're going to throw a couple of the Book of Mormon in. My, 
what would she be? Step niece? Step niece? Step niece was going, is going to be married in the Mormon church. Now, their beliefs, their practices are going to be totally foreign. We're not invited. Oh, we were invited, but we're not invited to the ceremony. We're invited to the you know, post. If you're not a Mormon, you can't go into the Mormon temple for the ceremony. So it will be you know, apart from a more civil ceremony later. So that's them adding to the scripture. And it's, well, anyway, I don't even know what to say about it. It's difficult to even begin to read. There's a foreword. As a matter of fact, we have a copy in our library. Uh, if you want to pull it out and take a look at it. There's a foreword. And I think that foreword was written by Joseph Smith. And it's just does not compute. It is not, you know, there's a certain holiness to the scripture. And just because you say you're a Bible doesn't mean you are a Bible. All right. So today's, you know, point is worldview. And how we understand eschatology is determined by our worldview. So there's two worldviews. And eschatology, where you say what that is, you know, that's the study of the future. And uh, there are three main parts. What are the three main parts? Well, let me just say this about eschatology first. It, it's a point of view that transcends culture. You know, it, it's, it, it transcends time, centuries. It is global in a sense, this worldview. And it changes, but overall, this worldview is a philosophical base to how we think and what we believe. So we need some big words because we're going to think big. All right, so let's dig in for some big words. Epistemology. Not to be confused with episiotomy. Episiotomy. <laughs> Epistemology. This is a branch of philosophy that deals with how we know or how we think we know and specifically what's true. Ontology, the study of being. What does it mean to exist? Teleology, the study of purpose. Why are we here? Where are we going? How do we get there? This is St. Augustine. And I got interested in St. Augustine when I was doing the Luther series because Luther was strongly influenced by St. Augustine. And here's the thing. He's a saint, but that's okay because he died around 420-something, and we didn't have the Protestant Reformation yet. So everything that happened back then, there's, in other words, he's still our saint. He still counts as one of our guys. Okay? We didn't throw out all the saints when we had uh, the Reformation. Now, St. Augustine wrote two books that are influential. The first one is called The Confessions. Actually, it's pretty entertaining. The other book, let's see, got it here. Ah! The other book is this, City of God, a mere 608 pages of delightful reading. And uh, <laughs> he wrote it in, right, following the fall of Rome, okay? Now, Rome was not the capital at that time, at 410. The capital had moved on to Ravenna, up there above, uh, uh, what was it, being, yeah, no, 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 what's the... Uh, well, Ravenna was on the Adriatic. It was on the Adriatic Sea. It was further north. All right. So, anyway, he wrote it in response to the fall of Rome. And here's a couple of questions I asked. How did the Romans get in? They walked in. Why did they walk in? Because there was no border. Where was the army? Doing something else. What did the barbarians, the Visigoths, what did they take? They took the gold and stuff. What did they do then? 
they left. And they left the Christians alone. Now, they weren't so kind to the pagans, but they left the Christians alone. If you were in a church and someone said, the Visigoths are coming, the Visigoths are coming, you say, oh, I'm going to go to church. They left you alone. Unheard of. Why did they do that? Because they were Christians. <laughs> Unbelievable. The barbarians at that time were actually Christians, and therefore they respected the churches. So, you know, he writes this book about society, and really one of the most influential books of the period. And let me just read a section here. He says, in regard to mankind, I have made a division. On the one side are those who live according to man. On the other, those who live according to God. The destiny of the one being the eternal kingdom under God, while the doom of the other is eternal punishment along with the devil. So he sees history as two cities, two cities, the city of God and the city of man, a.k.a. the city of the devil. Well, let's look at the characteristics. This worldview transcends a lot of time, starts in the Garden of Eden. We have Abel. We have Cain. We have theism. We have atheism. Members in the city of God love God. Members in the city of man spurn God. City of God, God is central. City of man, man is central. And here's this one's high lit. In the city of God, the members hold a classical biblical worldview. And here in the city of man, they hold a secular humanist worldview. And then St. Augustine says, okay, city of God, you're going to be under God, eternal kingdom. City of man, not so much. How do you know what city somebody belongs in? You know, now I know you guys, us, we all belong to the city of God because I know who you love. You love God. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. But is that true for everyone? Do you turn on the TV? You know, what are you seeing? Are you seeing people who love God? Not so much. Oops. Any questions about that? Okay. So we have these two worldviews. Again, secular humanist. And the word secular refers to world. And humanist refers to the humankind. And it's an ism. God-centered, man-centered. We believe in the reality of the fall and salvation. They say, nah, no such thing as fall. Mm -mm, nope. Mankind, number three, is inherently sinful. They say, inherently good. Evil is real, we say. They say, sin and evil don't exist. These are social constructs, but they don't have any reality. This is the way people think of stuff. Miracles have and can happen. And they say, mm -mm, no miracles. Jesus as the second person of the Godhead, and they say Jesus, comma, if he really existed, is not divine. Creation ex nihilo by divine fiat. They say creation ex nihilo by chance. Ex nihilo means, honey, ex nihilo. Oh, nihilo. Out of nothing. Out of nothing, right. It always helps to have a Latin scholar as a wife. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what, what they're saying, now we will talk about that more. They're saying creation comes from Nothing by chance. Well, it's worse than nothing because it's, well, nothing is no thing. We'll get to that later. We cannot save ourselves. And this is a big one. Mankind can self-save. Just give us enough time. We'll work on it. We'll get it figured out. It's not going well. <laughs> it's not going well at all. Bible is God's word. Bible is full of myths. Jesus truly rose from the dead. A judgment for heaven and hell awaits. No resurrection annihilation or universalism. Universalism means everybody gets in. How do you get to heaven, you would ask a person on the street? You die. 
that is not how you get to heaven. You get to heaven through faith and by the grace of God appropriated by uh, faith. But you don't get into heaven by just saying, here I am, I'm dead, take me in. And this is what people believe, isn't it? That all you gotta do to get to heaven is die. But you don't, you gotta do a little bit more before you die. You gotta do some pre-dying stuff. Truth is absolute. Truth is relative. Okay, what do you think about all those points? What do you think? Especially the ones that were, you know, the one here, this second from the bottom, annihilation. You see, a secular humanist would say, I would either rather be gone, in other words, you turn off the TV set, gone. That's annihilation. Never existed, you're gone, total. Turn off the computer, gone. Or I'm gonna believe that it's universalism. But what they don't want to believe is a judgment. No, you don't want to believe in judgment. So, all right. It was interesting, um, you know, William Shatner did the uh, SpaceX, you know, going out to outer space for those. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh -huh. And it was very, un he was, he was, instead of being inspired, he was like devastated. He was very depressed because he saw nothing. You know, he thought that there would be some, I guess, metanoia of, his faith or that there'd be some awareness of something bigger and better beyond. And so he went up in that space ride and came back down, but he's written a couple s stories about it. And a lot of people commented and said, oh, it was very profound, it was profound. And I found it very sad to think that he did that, went to the edge of our planet, you know, got to see our earth and it's all going, and he just felt we were alone, that that was it, it was just us. And I thought, I felt bad yet. He expressed that he had no faith. He had no sense of beyond, you know, uh, what we have here on this earth. Right. So, you know, for him, that experience, I guess he always felt there was something more out there, but he claims all he saw was black in our earth, and it was saddened him. And mm -hmm. I thought, I felt yeah. sad that he was saddened by that instead of uplifted into what maybe most of us Christians would see as a glorious experience, you know, seeing, oh my God, this magnificent. Like you say. It's magnificence beyond description, right. beyond imagination. Did he, yeah. did he forget about all those episodes? Did well, he? apparently, that's <laughs> what he thought. All he thought that they were going to be out. That's what they were like. It would bump him out because he thought they were going to explore space. And he thought, like, there was nothing. There was nothing to explore. Yeah, right. So I thought, oh, gee. Here's a couple of questions about how we identify a worldview. The first one is, how did you get here? And I'm not talking about your dodge. The question is, you are here and you're existing right now. How did that happen? How did it happen? I know you got moms and dads and all the ancestors, but the you, okay, the thing inside, which is you, how did you get here? Huh? How you answer that question will help identify your worldview. Anything about that? How you got here? How about this one? Why are you here? Okay. Once we establish that you're here, then why are you here? Okay. This relates, to, well, the first one is ontology. The second one is teleology. Anybody here know what the Baltimore Catechism is? Anybody? Dang. I'm the only Catholic around. <laughs> the Baltimore Catechism, well, a catechism is a Q&A to teach. Um, and in parochial school, you would have the Baltimore Catechism from Baltimore you know, City, and it's Q&A. Question one, question one, I'll re remember this. Who made you? Answer, God made me. Question number two. Why did God make you? Answer, to know, love, and serve him in this world and to be happy with him in the next. Bingo, you got it. Nothing fancy. How does everything end? This will help you identify your worldview. Does it just end in a cosmic explosion where 
and this is what they believe, ultimately, not yet, the day will come when everything simply, well, boom, it's gone. Long time from now, but it's going to happen. We know differently. We know that it happens when the Lord takes us back. Can you prove that God exists? How are you doing with that one? Actually, that's the easiest one to answer because, because I can take this marker and I can say this marker is all the proof I need that God exists. And you say, huh? Think about this. This does not have independent existence. This is why, you know, I would get up in the middle of the night, you know, and just be thinking about it. So I spent a lot of time thinking about it. This does not have independent existence. It exists in time and space only because God exists. Okay, think about that. It, it takes a while. This exists only because God exists. Now, not everybody, like I said, it took me a long time to think that one through. But, yeah. How about you yourself? How do you know that you really exist? One of my religion teachers back in high school said to us, once upon a time, you did not exist. That's true. But now you do. That's also true. And he continued, and you exist for all eternity. And that's also true. But how do we prove it? Ex nihilo nil fit. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Okay? Remember Sound of Music, Maria to the Captain, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could? Huh? So somewhere in my childhood, I'm I must have done something good. You remember that? Okay. Nothing comes from nothing. Now, what do we mean by nothing? Non existence. Can you comprehend non existence? That's a tough one. I can comprehend blackness, I can comprehend space, but I cannot comprehend non-existence. And what the world says, out of a non-existence, existence happens. How? Okay. So this is going to be our first Latin phrase, you know, we're going to learn two of them, and I'm going to have to hurry up with the second one. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Okay. Only God is pre-existent. So here's the other thing. Suppose I say, you people sitting here are just a figment of my imagination. Okay, anybody ever think that way? Oh, I don't think that way, but you know, ever hear of anybody who thinks that way? You are just a figment of my imagination. It's called solipsism, solipsism. And my Bugs Bunny has something to say about that. <laughs> Solipsism. That says, in effect, that there's only one mind in the universe that is managing it all, putting together this wonderful TV show. Well, okay. This guy, one of my favorites, Rene Descartes. Now, he questioned everything, just questioned everything. He says, How do I know that I exist myself? Okay, well, I don't know, how do you know that? And he finally comes up with this, cogito ergo sum. And that means? Oh God. Um, oh, cogito? I think, I think, therefore, I am. Correct. Right. I think, therefore, I am. Cogito, I think, therefore, I am. Okay. Therefore, and is. therefore, God is. See? And therefore, God is. So for him, the very fact that he could think, his very act of thinking was sufficient proof that God exists. Now, it takes a while to you know, percolate, but I really appreciate what he did in that, that sense. Okay, I don't know if we have time for all this, but I'm gonna run through. Epistemology, study of truth, okay? Let me just, what is truth? Well. Pilate asked that question, what is truth? And here are the characteristics. Divine, absolute, singular, objective, immutable. And what that means then 
is that it comes from God. It's absolutely true. Just one truth, objective and doesn't change. And what city is built upon truth? City of God. Yeah, city of God. Can a man become pregnant? You know? And I'm thinking, first of all, this is why I thank God that I am a man. <laughs> you know? Can a man become pregnant? You hear it on the news or in some place here and there. And if you question them, you are a bigot, you are a homophobe, you are a whatever phobe that they can name you with. And they say, what is wrong with you? Of course a man can become pregnant. I don't know how. Here's the thing. We had a candidate to the Supreme Court, the last one. And the question was asked, what is a woman? She could not answer that. She said, I'm not a biologist. I'm a biologist, I can tell you. She couldn't answer it because it was politically incorrect. What city does that belong in? The basics, you cannot define a gender. You're gonna say, what, you know, man, woman? I don't know, I don't know, I get. But here's the thing, speaking as a biologist, remember all the teaching I did, in order to carry a pregnancy, you need stuff that men don't have. You gotta have a uterus, <laughs> okay? You need a uterus. And even if you could do a uterine transplant, it's not gonna work because you need hormones. We say, well, we'll give you some hormones. Well, okay, we can take some hormones and bingo, nine months later, we cut you open and there's a baby. That is a monstrosity. That is not God's will. That's not his intention. Now, if you think that men can become pregnant, mazel tov. But I, <laughs> mazel tov means good luck. You know, we can't, and we thank God for it. <laughs> here's, here's the thing between men and women, okay? A woman has a pregnancy, and she says, man, that hurt so much. I think I'll do it again. <laughs> she tells her friends, this, good idea. If a man had a pregnancy, he would say, that hurt so much. And they say, we believe you, man. <laughs> Not gonna happen. <laughs> They would never do it again. It would only take one man to convince the rest of us. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. So anyway. I, oh, the Book of Mormon. Yeah, there we go. Plagiarized from uh, King James, Pilgrim's Progress. No map of book locations. What's interesting about that? You open your Bible to the front and the back. You're going to find maps. Okay, here's Jericho, you know, here's Jerusalem and all the rest. There's no map because all the places they name don't exist. Oh well. Uh, okay, I should probably end this. This is a lot. This is a lot. Okay. So, okay. We can do this more uh, next time. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this. Here's my concern. Here's my concern about the youth of our country, the youth of our church. I want to ask you rhetorically, the children and the grandchildren you know, can they say the Our Father from memory? Probably not. I know, I know that we spent a lot of time with our grandchildren, but I don't think that they would know it now. I fear for the, the youth because they don't have the instruction. Now, we're an older congregation, so the youth movement uh, is anybody 50 or over. Uh, but for generally speaking, the young people are not grounded in uh, the truth. Anyway, um, there's much more I could say about that. And I don't want to, you know, you know, belabor it. Anything, any thoughts about the young people and what they know or don't know? Yeah. yeah um, I, I'm, I'm in a rotary here locally, and we have what we call an interact group. And uh, if you ask any of the Rotarians, they'd say, I don't like children. That'd be pretty accurate, actually. But <laughs> uh, the interactors 
our, our young people who start at about, about age 12 go through high school and they learn the values of Rotary. Uh, and of the t kids that are in Interact, by far, they're, they're very well grounded. They're, they're scholastically doing very well. They're very good about social, uh, um, being involved in, in social things. And almost every one of them was brought up in a home where it was faith based. And that has always struck me as something very interesting because most of the kids today, when, if they turn out well, they've turned out well because they come, generally speaking, I'm not saying all yeah. of them, but generally speaking, they come from a faith-based background. And so, to your point, I fear for those kids that are not yes. raised in a, it, with God in mind, whether it's in a Jewish home or, or any particular religion, because I do believe that most religions preach doing good for others and not intentionally doing harm to others. And without that basic background, y your future is up for grabs. Yeah. And they're up for grabs because they'll believe anything that comes down the pike. Right. Just today, I'm hearing about uh, the anxieties of the young people. They're anxious about everything. Oh, yeah. You know, we're anxious about uh, climate change, anxious about the pandemic, even though it's over, anxious about this and that and the other thing. Why are they so anxious? There's no ground in this. There's no. Say hello to a teenager today, and what do you get? A, a version of eyes, and they won't even talk to you because they don't trust anybody. Yeah because they have no social skills. You could say hello on the phone. Sure. You could text them if you knew how to, if, what their phone number was. But interaction between other people, especially strangers, you can see the fear in their eyes. It just, it, it shocks me. Yeah, that, uh, it, yeah. It just does, it really does. I really fear for young people today. Well, thank you everybody. I know uh, we're a little bit over time. We, you know, have places to go, things to do, lunch to eat, you know. Uh, I'm going to be here. I'll stick around. Uh, but please, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, you know. Next time it will be talking about uh, the events of the first century, time and eternity. And that's a, I think it's great. Okay, thank you.